Okay, this is section 4.3, PowerPoint voiceover. I start out, there are three different calculator functions that you make use of in this section. So I start out showing you the factorial rule, the permutation rule, and the combination rule. Obviously, you won't be able to click on this because this is a video. This will be in the actual PowerPoint that I, you'll see uploaded in um, tonight's homework assignment. So there's a link to it, and if you click on this, little um, arrow here it'll play out so make sure that you take a look at that this slide here is the three examples one is the um factorial rule and the second is the um, permutation rule and the third is combinations all right so these three i just illustrated in the uh, video that's in that first slide obviously you can do it pencil and paper you know, it's 8 factorial divided by 8 minus 5, but why Why would you want to go through all this? Right? Your calculator would do it. Same thing with 8 factorial or any factorial. Sure, you can go 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 and all the way down to 1, but by hitting the 8, hitting the, uh, going to the, math, the uh, math key, arrowing over the probability, and going down to factorial is a lot easier. It gets the answer a lot quicker. So. All right, the main focus of this section is using um, counting formulas, trees and counting techniques. When outcomes were equally likely, back when we started this in section 401, we, compute, we computed the probability of an event by using the formula. Hey, what are the number of favorable outcomes over the number of total outcomes? The probability formula requires that we're able to determine the total number of outcomes in a sample space. In previous problems we had done in previous sections, this task has not been difficult. The total, for instance, 52 cards in a deck, we all knew that. You throw a pair of dice, there are 36 ways that you can, numbers can come up, a one and a one, a one and a two, and so forth. A woman has a child, it's either a boy or a girl, you know it's two. Or if you were given a bag of marbles, they would tell you there are so many marbles in the bag. Or if you're talking about men and women, he would tell you. Well, in problems we've done in the previous sections, it hasn't been difficult. But now things get a little complicated. So we need to, but the whole focus here is the number of total outcomes. All right, so um, the tools we present in this section will help you count the, the number of possible outcomes in larger sample spaces or those formed by more complicated events. When an outcome of an experiment is composed of a series of events, we use what's called the multiplication rule. That sounds familiar. We did that back in 4 or 4 2. He says, consider the events E1 through EM. Hey, what's the total number of ways that. Um, Possible outcomes, well, it's N1 times N2 times N and so forth, all the way out to N sub M. Now, what, is that, what does this all mean? This next slide will, will help you out. Jacqueline is a nurse, is in the nursing program, is required to take a course in psychology, one in A and P, and she also wants to take Spanish too. There are two sections, when she goes to register, there are two sections of psychology, two of A and P. And three courses of uh, three uh, classes that are available in Spanish too. Now the question is, how many different class schedules can Jacqueline choose from? He says, assume that the times in sections, time of the sections, do not um, conflict. He says, using the information, let's make a tree diagram. Well, you're not going to make a tree diagram, but what we're going to do is show you how the answer is derived and show you a faster way of getting to the number of possible schedules. All right, so here's Jacqueline now at the registrar's office. She's got two sections of psychology to choose from. All right, let's say, for instance, she chooses this one here. She's got two sections of A and P to choose from, and then she has three sections of Spanish. So as you can see at the ends here, if I count these, you know, this would be a one and a one and a one, a one and a one and a two, a one and a one and a three. So there's three here, three there, three there, total of, Four times three or 12 different schedules that Jack could possibly choose for next semester. It says creating a class schedule can be considered an experiment with a series of three events. Two possible outcomes for psychology, two for A and P, and three for managed two. By the multiplication rule, two times two times three. 
This two is the number of psychology courses. This is the number of A&P. And the three is the number of Spanish. Twelve different class schedules. A lot easier using the multiplication rule than, you know, trying to sit there and construct a tree diagram. He did it to show you that the answers are identical. Chronological order. Consider the following question given on a history test. Arrange the following events in chronological order. Well, the correct answer is ACB. The Boston Tea Party happened first. Uh, the uh, Civil War happened second. And the Teapot Dome scandal. But let's say you're guessing. All right. You have two. Um, you're just guessing at this. Well, for the first event, you get three choices, all right? Which happened first? You get three, the Boston Tea Party, the Teapot, Dome Scandal, and the Civil War. After you choose one of those, you've only got two possible answers left for the second thing that happened chronologically. And then after you've picked the second one, you've only got one left. So the number of different ways you possible arrangements are three times two times one, which is a total of six. Now, very important. Yes, the primary, the primary function is to find the total number of ways something can occur. But don't get it twisted because he, the questions on an exam may ask you for the probability that you randomly guess the, in this case, the chronological order. Well, if there's six total arrangements, only one of those six is going to be the correct one, A, C, B. So your probability is one over six. But you know, even though some of these problems ask you for probability, invariably, then there's only going to be a one in the numerator, the number of correct answers. Your job is going to be to figure out that denominator, in this case here, was six. So even though we're working with total number of arrangements, the problems you see may ask you for probability. The good news is the numerator, the number of favorable is only going to be one, and the denominator will be whatever you calculate it to be. Probability is still part of what's going on here. Identity theft. It's not wise to disclose social security numbers. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Because they can often be used by criminals attempting identity theft. Assume a criminal is found using a social and claims all the digits were randomly selected. What's the probability that this person, this crook, just happened to guess? Well, <laughs> the social has one, two, has nine digits in it. All right, so... It could be the first number could be anything from zero to nine. The second number could be anything from zero to nine. The third number. So there's ten choices for the first, ten for the second, ten for the third, all the way out to ten choices for the ninth number. Ten times itself, nine times is one billion. So the probability that he gets your social, well, your social is only one number. One chance in one billion. Now he didn't guess it or she didn't guess it. They went through, somehow they found your social, whatever, they found your wallet, or they went through your garbage. Identity theft, one in a billion. Now, no one's going to guess that. The odds are pretty high. They found it another way. How many ways can eight books be arranged on a shelf? Well, you get eight books, all right? So you get any one of the eight that's going to be first. After you choose that first book, you get seven books for the second slot on the shelf. After you pick that one, you've only got six for the third, six books to choose from for the third slot, then five, then four, then three, all the way down to one. There are 40,320 different arrangements. Now, arrangements means that order, the word arrangements means that order counts. By order counting, I mean uh, one, two, three, and three, two, one are different arrangements. They counted separately. You see the word arrangements. He's talking about order counting. All right. Uh, as far as factorial, by definition, zero factorial is one. One factorial is one. N factorial is N times one less than N. N minus one times N minus two and so forth. And we use this, um, the exclamation point. So four factorial, four times three times two times one, 24. Special definition is zero factorial. And what we're going to be doing routes to national parks during the summer you are you plan on visiting six national parks glacier yellowstone and so forth you you would like to plan the most efficient route and you decide to list all the possible routes well by applying the factorial rule there are six different parks can be arranged in six factorial different ways 
You have six pockets to choose first to go to, and then you got five left, fall by three times two times seven hundred and different ways you can arrange those six those six different pockets. Now, what is maybe what the what the question asks you? Well, what's the probability that you randomly select the fastest way to get to all six? Well, there's only one fast route. Fast route. Fastest route is only one of them. One over a total of 720 would be your probability that you randomly select the shortest route between those six parks on your vacation. One over a total of 720. A sales rep. You must visit four cities, Omaha, Dallas, Wichita, and Oklahoma City. There are direct data connections between all the cities. Use the multiplication rule to determine the number of different choices. Well, he's got four ch choices for the first city to visit. If he chooses that city, he's three left. He chooses a second city, he's only two left. For the, and then finds only one city left. So there's 24 possible routes. Four times three times two times one of the multiplication rule. Pretty simplistic. All right, um, using the obligation rule, we get 24. I could have done four factorial. We've gotten 24 just that way there. But, you know, in that case, you have four times, three times, two times one you can do in your head. I don't think there'd be any need of using a calculator, but four factorial, 24. We've considered the number of ways of arranging eight books on a shelf. All right, there was 40,320. What if you have, you have a small shelf? You got eight books, but you only got room for three. Well, there's eight, you have eight books to choose for first, then seven for the second, second choice, and then six for the third choice. 336 ways you can arrange, if you have eight books, that you can arrange three books. The choice of eight, we only have room for three. There are 336 ways you can arrange those eight books to be three times. The formula, there's a way of doing this, another way of doing it. And the formula we can use to compute this number, this 336, is called a permutation formula. As we see in the next examples, the permutation rule is really nothing more than a, another version of the multiplication rule. To arrange, the number of ways to arrange in order indistinct objects, taking them hour at a time, is formula right here, n factorial divided by n minus r factorial. Key thing here is when you're doing permutation, order is important. A, B, C, and C, B, A are different arrangements. Same three letters, but you're arranging them differently. So by the common, I'm sorry, by the permutation rule, eight things taken three at a time. Now, the reason I'm using permutation is that order makes a difference. Order is important. I, yes, I could use the formula, but why would I put myself through that when I can just plug an 8 in, go to math, arrow to probability, come down to permutations, put a 3 in, hit enter, 336. Let's compute the number of possible ordered seating arrangements. When I see the word arrangements, I'm thinking permutation. All right, so we got eight people, but we only have five chairs. All right. In this case, we are considering a total of eight different people, and we wish to arrange five of these people in these chairs. All right, so by the multiplication rule, any one of the eight people could sit in the first chair, then I got seven that can sit in the second, six, followed by five, and then finally I got four people, four choices for the last to fifth chair. But by doing it by using my calculator, just as fast, if not faster. There are 6,720 possible arrangements or to making a big difference. Which is in the first year and which is in the second year. All right, so there it is done by the formula. I don't see yourself doing, I don't see yourself even remembering this formula or even writing it down. I would go right to my calculator. He's just showing you here how the answers are exactly the same. I uh, usually. So the pencil and paper versus using the calculator. Eight things taken five at a time. Order makes a difference. It's kind of a classic problem here. You get three offices: president, vice president, and treasurer must be elected among the members. How many different slates are possible? He says we will review. We will review a slate of offices as a list of three people, where the president is first, the vice president is second, and the treasurer is listed third. For instance, if Mr. Costa, Mr. Hill, and Mr. Smith wish to be on a slate together, there are several different slates possible depending depending on 
uh, the person listed for each office. In other words, you know, Mr. Costa could be running for president, Ms. Hill for vice president, and then you could have Mr. Smith running for treasurer. Now, if I mix that up, if I go Miss, Mrs. Hill first, Mr. Costa second, Mr. Smith, now Mrs. Miss Hill is running for president instead of Mr. Costa. It's a different arrangement. All right, so it's a permutation rule. All right, because order makes a difference, and the order in which they're listed on the ballot makes a big difference. You want the right person running for president, the right person running for VP, and the right person running for uh, treasurer. Order makes a difference. A permutation. All right, so here are the requirements. You have M for permutation and different items available. Select R of them without replacement. We consider rearrangements of the same items to be different sequences. By that, I mean A, B, C is a different arrangement than C, B, A, and it's counted separately. Here's the formula, but I've also showed you way back when how to do this with your calculator. In each of the preceding or previous uh, counting formulas, we have taken order of the objects or people into account. However, suppose that in your political science class, you're given a list of 10 books and you are to read four during the semester. The order in which you read the books isn't an important. We are interested in the different groupings or combinations. All right. We're not interested in arrangements, but now interested in groupings. The order in which you read those four out of 10 books, who cares? The next form, it tells us how to compute the number of different combinations versus permutations. And there's a formula. The difference is you have this R factorial in the denominator. Here again, I wouldn't sweat the formula. Your main thing is when you're given a problem, you've got to decide. Does order make a difference? If order makes a difference, hey, I'm using a uh, permutation rule. If order doesn't make a difference, I'm using a combination rule. If I'm taking all of the items and I'm arranging them, then we have the permutation rule. All right. In your political science class, here again, you know, you're assigned to read four books out of ten. How many different groups? All right, so I could use the formula here at the bottom to come up with 210 or simply use my calculator. I would obviously opt to use the calculator. Combinations rather than a permutation. The reason it's a combination is because the order in which you read the books is unimportant. Or it doesn't make it different as opposed to that slate of people running for election, where president, vice president, and secretary, if you rearrange the names, you got a different person running for president, different person running for VP, and different treasurer. Or it didn't make a difference there, it doesn't here. All right, so there it is using the calculator. All right, um, and things taken forward at time. Order does not make a difference. All right, eight books, how many groups? When I see groups or combinations, and I know it's a combination. Eight things taken three at a time, 56. How many different five-person committees? Now, think about a committee. Unlike president, vice president, and secretary, committee members, are, they're all committee members. No one's any more important you know, than any others. All right, committee members, kind of a classic combination problem. You're on a committee, you're on a committee. It's not the same thing as being an officer, right? Order of the people, how they're selected, don't make a bit of difference with a committee. And you should have gone back to the previous slide. So it's five, 20 things taken five at a time. It's a combination. The classic problem that you know it's a combination when you're given committee. If you're given a slate of offices, order makes a difference. It's a classic Doing the computer DAS special promotion, a customer purchases a computer and a printer, then you're given a, you know, a choice of three software packages. When you walk out of the store, it doesn't make a difference which order those three free software packages are under your arm. You've got three free packages of software. You don't care. You're walking out of the store with it. The order in which you do that doesn't make a difference. The order in which you stack them under your arm. How many different groups? Well, that kind of gives it away. It's a combination versus a combination. So it's 10 things taken three at a time. There it is using the formula. All right. But here again, it's so much easier to do. The calculator is making it easier. But the calculator is doing all of this. Now you see this formula. 
Many of you may be familiar with the lottery, um, the megabucks. You're given 49 numbers. Your job is to pick six out of those 49. Now, here's a, a image of a megabucks ticket. Notice how the numbers are printed. They're printed sequentially from smallest to largest. Now, you don't, when the lottery comes out, you don't have, the numbers don't have to come out sequentially. It to, what you have to do is get the six numbers, six out of 49. Order don't make a difference. All right. As long as you have, for instance, 12, 18, 25, 29, 32. If the 32 comes out first and the 25, you don't care as long as you get these six numbers. It's hard enough to win the lottery where order doesn't count. Imagine if you had to pick it numbers and pick them. And here's another thing. You can't pick them in different order because they print the tickets out smallest first. Order doesn't make a difference. You can watch this video. You can see how the numbers come out. But then when they show them, they put them smallest first, followed by the next biggest and so forth. Order doesn't make a difference. All right, this is from the lottery. He says, hey, the odds of winning, if you buy one ticket, is 1 in 13,983,000. And there it is, 49 things taken six at a time. Combination. Order doesn't make a bit of difference. I mean, the odds are of you winning right now are 1 in 13 million where order doesn't count. If order did count, it'd be, you know, in the hundreds of millions to one. Get with it now, let alone the world. All right, this is a Colorado State lottery. You, get 40, you only, I say, only have 42 numbers. You're going to pick six. How many different combinations are there? Well, it looks to be 5,245,000. So the probability of you winning if you bought one ticket would be one out of, there's only one winning ticket, one out of 5,245,786. So you say to yourself, well, I'm going to beat the odds. I'm going to buy, you know, I'm going to buy 10 tickets. Well, here's your odds here, 0. 0.00002 if you bought 10 tickets. I'm going to buy 100 tickets. So you're going to spend 100 bucks. And your odds of winning are tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands. You have two in a hundred thousand of winning, two chances in a hundred thousand. If you put down, you've actually spent a hundred dollars on this. You know, I just do. You know, everybody says, you know, someone's going to win eventually. You know, that's why people play the lottery. You can dream for, dream for a day. These are the different examples of different state lotteries. I'm not even sure these are current. All right, and then these are the ways of winning. All this is is some practice with the calculator. All right, entering in 36 things, five at a time, 50 pieces at a time. He's doing it pencil and paper. You can check this with your calculator just to make sure you're up to speed. And this was on a lottery with 31 different choices. You're to pick five numbers. All right. Um, notice the difference here. Um, 31 numbers, choose five. It's a combination. You have a, a one in 169,911 chance of winning. If you had for some crazy reason pick him in the right order, which doesn't even begin to make sense, your odds of winning would be one in 20 million. So it's tough enough to win when order doesn't count, let alone if they meet a lottery where order did count. Nobody would play because the odds would be so crazy. Uh, Powerball, many of you are familiar with this. You're going to match five numbers out of 69, plus you need the Powerball. There's 26 of those numbers. You have to get the right five out of 69, and you have to get the right Powerball. Well, and means it's a multiplication problem, all right? So this value times 26, you can see the probability, as illustrated from the lottery site, is 292,200,000. 1,338. This is right from the lottery page. You can see how we've done it. I've done it with a calculator. This is a little different because you have to get this and you have to get the Powerball number. You know, talking about the lottery, there are about 1.7 um, automobile cost fatalities for every 100 million miles driven. All that being said, you drive to the, to buy a Powerball ticket, the chance of, if you drive one mile, all right, if you drive one mile to, to the store to buy a Powerball ticket, your chance of being killed or killing someone else is about 10 times greater than the chance that you win the jackpot, the Powerball jackpot. 
Or if you played Russian roulette with Powerball odds, you could play Russian roulette for 79, 100 times a day for 79 years and you wouldn't kill yourself. That's how crazy the odds are. But people play. Now, here's the deal. You're, you're thinking, well, if the answer could be a permutation or if the answer could be a combination, I'll just try them both. And I'll pick the answer that I see on the answer sheet. Well, here's a case where we're asked for the probability of winning. I'm sorry, the organizer of a television show, a show would select five people to participate. The participants will be selected from a group of 30 people. If the participants are selected at random, what's the probability that the five youngest people are selected? Well, you either have the five youngest or you don't have the five youngest. There's only one favorable outcome. So A has a chance, B has a chance. I don't know where this four is coming. And C has a chance. Now, I did, I found the denominator by first using a permutation. But look, that's the answer B. Then I did a combination, and that's answer A. So if you think you're going to outfox the test by doing it both ways and picking the, well, guess what? Both answers are there. Here's the deal. Sometimes I ask you to read the problem and understand what's happening, but don't overread it. When people see the five youngest, they think for some reason that the people have to be arranged in order from youngest to oldest or from oldest to youngest. But notice the problem doesn't say that. It just says, hey, the five youngest. If I've got five people, Brenda and John, Izzy, Pat, and uh, let's say, um, Steve, all right? And then I rearrange those people. You know, Steve's first, Brenda and John a second, Pat and Izzy a third. You know, it's I still have the five youngest people. The problem never said they had to be in a correct order from youngest to oldest or oldest to youngest. So you got to avoid. It's why it's a combination. Order doesn't make a difference. You either have the five youngest or you don't. The problem doesn't say anything about them being in order, all right? Just the five youngest. So it's a combination versus a permutation. So the correct answer would be A and not B. Read the problem, but don't overread it. All right. Um, board of directors. Well, it's a classic combination because, you know, it's a committee. Twelve different people. No one's any more important. You need to select three. And here again, the word groups gives it away. If it says arrangements. That points you to a permutation. Groupings or combinations are all combinations. And there's the two formulas, which I'm saying you don't have to use because your calculator does all the work. All right. Make sure you put some time and effort into this. There's a section 4.3 worksheet. And then I actually, for this one, and this is the only time I do it for Chapter 4 because it's, it's the most challenging, I actually give you a chapter review. Which I didn't do for the first time out, you won't see the get it. Different being is this one this one here is this chapter is challenging, so you got a chapter review. In preparation for the actual exam on the 